Abba Father, we thank you for this time that uh, we can uh, go over some of these precious passages in your word. Uh, we ask that you help us to understand and as we study, as we meditate upon your word, we ask that we may be transformed into the image of your son, Hashem Yeshua Mashiach Amen. <clears throat> so today is this week is Parasha Yitro. Can you say Yitro? Yitro, which means Jethro. Uh, Jethro was Moshe's father-in-law. He has another name, Ruel. Reuel. Can you say Reuel? R e U E L, which means shepherd of God. So, what is, is his name? Yitro, Yitro, Ruel, Yitro, Yuel, Ruel, Yitro. What's his name? So, some people say that well, he was a shepherd. We know that. So, Ruel was his name. Some people say, but some people have said that. The name Yitro is actually more of a title. He was a priest in Midian, so he was a leader. And the word Yitro in Hebrew comes from the word, a similar word is the word Yoter, Yoter. Yoter means more, like for example, if I say, you all, you all know the word, here's a Hebrew class for you. You all know the word Tov. Tov, right? Good. Yuter Tov means better. You know, you only know the word Yafe. What is Yafe? Beautiful. Beautiful. Yuter Yafe means more beautiful. Beautiful. No, we don't do that. You know, so, Yitro, some people say it's actually more of a title because he was a leader. This is some of the discussions people have. With. Anyway, this is the name of the parasha today and uh, <clears throat> this week. And this week, as I was talking with a friend of mine, he was telling me about a teaching that he read that's, that his friend shared with him, a teaching that was called, What if Yeshua meant exactly what he said? Ooh, quite an audacious project to work on. What if Yeshua meant exactly what he said? Oh. So this week we read we read about the beginning of the giving of the Torah, the beginning at Mount Horeb. So I thought, what if the Torah was given today? What if, you know, the Torah was given at a certain time? But what if it were given today? What would he talk about? What would he talk about? What if uh, Hashem were to come on Mount Hood and say, okay, you guys, that's, even, that's an even more audacious project to work on. The word Torah means instruction, teaching. It's usually, sorry, I know some of the slides are not that clear, but the main things are clear. I will do better next time. So um, the word Torah is usually translated in Bibles as the word law, but it's actually a wrong interpretation. The word law in Hebrew would be the word dinam. Um, Torah comes from the word, there is a similar word, the word uh, more. More means teacher. More for a male teacher, mora for a female teacher. And Torah is from that same, uh, means instruction, teaching. Really, instruction would be even better. Instruction. The word Torah is used. 
we, when we say Torah, we usually put a capital T on it because we refer to God's Torah. Hebrew doesn't have capital letters. But the word Torah is used in Hebrew often in a way that would be without the capital T. Like, and even in the Bible, we even find that. For example, uh, when King Solomon, uh, in the beginning of the Proverbs, he says, remember the instruction of your mother. Basically, what's written, remember the Torah of your mother. Because the Torah is an instruction by somebody who instructs. Is a teaching of a teacher. So, but now we're talking about Torah, capital T. The big instruction, capital I. Okay? So, a teaching is done usually for the purpose of instructing. Right? We don't teach because we don't... We teach because we want to instruct. Right? I know it sounds very duh, but if we read the word Torah as the word instruction, that means the purpose that was to give to for the Torah to be given was to teach something. And a teacher teaches something because he feels that his audience has a gap in knowledge. There is something that they need to learn. Okay? So the Torah was given for the same reason. Because they felt that people had a gap in knowledge. God felt that people needed to learn something. There are many things they didn't know. And God is just person. He's not going to punish people for things they don't know. So he felt, well, they need to know, you know. So Hashem gave the Torah to the people because he felt they had a lack of knowledge. Now, from the beginning of human history, I would say that our social report card has been disastrous because we have a gap in knowledge of how to practice love balanced with justice or justice balanced with love. We have a gap in knowing how to handle wealth or poverty. We have a gap in knowing how to handle freedom as well as oppression. We have a gap in knowing how to handle knowledge or ignorance, ours and that of others. We have a gap in knowing how to define priorities and responsibilities. We have a gap in knowing how to handle struggles with others and struggles in our lives. We have a gap in knowing how to handle spirituality. So the Torah was given to us as a solution to address these problems, to teach us how to handle these things. But the Torah, capital T, instruction, capital I, that we refer to right now when we say the Torah, is the one that was given to the children of Israel as they had just come out from Egyptian slavery, Egyptian oppression. That was the background. That was the theater upon which this Torah was given. The, the whole idea behind it. As a result, the children of Israel had their own set of social issues and problems, which I would say were not 
all that different from the ones from this uh, the set of social issues and problems they had in the generation of the master and not even so different as the ones we have today. The children of Israel with their one God, with no statue, no nothing, no, no, uh, yeah, the invisible God, lived in a society that were that was contrary to their values. Because of what happened in Egypt, they faced the tendency towards anger, hatred, and revenge. And as they established themselves as a nation, even right there in the desert, as they established their political and leadership structure, they faced political rivalries and jealousies. We'll see them when we talk about Korah and all the things. And also, they were faced in learning how to serve that God, that invisible God who saved them. They didn't know. They had no clue. And they also, in view of that, they were faced to learn how to establish priorities in their lives. That was, that's a lot to learn, and it's not so different than what people had to learn in the days of Yeshua, and also in what we have to learn in our days. They also faced all the social and economic issues and problems that we face today that fill, overfill our court systems. That's why Yitro came and told Moshe, hey, you can't do this by yourself. You gotta delegate a little bit, get yourself some help. They're running your ragged. So the Torah on Mount Horeb came as a solution in the form of instructions to answer their current problems, which I would say again were not so different than the one they faced in the days of Yeshua and that we face in our day. The Torah on Mount Horeb was given to the children of Israel in order to teach them how to deal with their lives. But the Torah, whereas it has commandments, it's not just was not and is not just a set of commandments. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. Black and white, I wish it were. It's so easy, so much easier. But what it was, what, what happened is that the Torah also pointed to principles that taught people the spirit in which to handle their lives on earth with its many problems. It was not just a bunch of commandments. These commandments also taught principles that taught them how to respond and deal with their lives. It taught them how to react to life on earth as it is. It didn't give them pie in the sky dreams. It didn't give them false hopes. It taught them how to deal with it as it is, how to react to it as it is, which is exactly what Yeshua did in the Sermon on the Mount. When he saw people that are mourning, he didn't tell them, oh, people are so mean to you, you should blah, blah, blah. He says, no, hey, you mourn? Oh, great, you have such a blessing on you in the world to come. Remember that, okay? And set your eyes on that blessing in the future, okay? Yes, you're sure. You know, so really, one of the main lessons, as Sue, I said, how to react to life as it is, because 
as it is, whether it's then or now, none of us can control what life seems to cruelly dish out to us at times. None of us have control of that. But the control we have, we all like control, right? Ooh. How do you say control in sign language? Control. <laughs> control the horses, right? <laughs> you know, uh, what we have control over is our reaction to life's cruel predicaments. We, we can't help what comes out to us. I'm telling you, we don't know we're going to turn on the TV and just, oh no! Or we're going to open our emails and, oh no! Someone's going to come to the door, oh my! Or we're going to wake up, oh no! You know? So, but what we have control is how we interpret these things, how we react to them, how we process them. You know, think about that. As far as I'm concerned, in my humble opinion, and you're all welcome to my humble opinion, this is our ultimate control. This is our ultimate freedom. The one and only that no one can ever take away from us. Not the president, not the king, not the government, not the police. No one can ever take our control of how we interpret the what happens to our lives, our reactions. That might be the ultimate control until we die. Actually, it is. We can give in to anger, revenge. We can give in to all this stuff, you know, but we don't have to. You know a grudge? We usually use the expression hold on, holding on to a grudge. We just have to let go, you know? So no one can ever take that freedom away from us. The freedom of how we react to whatever happens to us. No one can force you to react in the way that you don't want to. No one. To me, what that means, if, you, if we really fear God, if we really fear the Lord, we will react to life in the way that he teaches us in the Torah. To, to fear the Lord is to do what is right, because you know we know he's reward, he rewards us for it, or to, and to not do what, we, what is wrong, because he rewards us for that too. That's the basic of fear of the Lord, to know right and wrong, and choose right, choose life, choose not to eat from the fruit of that tree. You know, give us freedom of choice. You know, and but if we, if we, if we fear God, we will react the right way. You know, and for me, it's almost like another way of saying what Yeshua said: Do not fear those who kill the body but are powerless to fear to kill the soul. Rather, fear him can destroy both. Soul and body in Gehenna. You know, when we fear the Lord, only <coughs> we don't react in a way that displeases Him. We don't want to. We may, but we don't want to. We fight against that. <coughs> this type of reaction. Oh, and sometimes we fail to react the right way. We're, we're human. I don't know about you, but I do sometimes. We fail to react the way we should. We react the way we shouldn't. But we, we need to realize that this time in our life, this age, this time of our life is, is like school. In school, we're given problems, tests. And we have to take, to take them until we pass. You know, so sometimes we're given, that's why I really like this saying, it's not biblical, but it says, as long as there is life, there is hope. Because for me, if I if I was through a test at a certain point in my life and I totally flubbed it, totally, I somebody did something to me and instead of taking it the way 
and got angry and blah blah blah. Then after uh, in the evening I can say, oh boy, gosh. Uh. But as long as there is life, there is a hope that it will happen again. And this time I'll do better. Or maybe I'll fail again. You know, it's like you know we to me that's how we when we when we are faced twice with the same issue and the second time or third time or fourth time, we finally react the right way. Yes, we've grown. We've learned. You know, we've learned. And that that's the grave that Hashem looks at. You know, so it's important. So again, the freedom to react the way we should out of our God endowed free freedom of choice and the freedom to obey God instead of man, man being either others or ourselves, right? Instead of man's inner animal instinct, that's our greatest freedom. No one can take that away from us. No one, never, ever, ever, ever. It's God given. No one can take it away. The only people who can take it away is ourselves. You know? And um, there is a mountaineer. I don't know if you know his name. His name is George Mallory. He's known for having said, it's not the mountain we conquer, it's ourselves. And he who conquers himself and his own uh, tendency, his own animal instinct, has conquered more than any mountains. The freedom to process the cruelty of life, as Hashem teaches us to in the Torah, Again, that's one that Hashem gave us. It's called freedom of choice, majesty of choice. That's the name for it. Majesty of choice. You know, like he, he put Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, okay, you can eat from anything except the fruit of that tree. He didn't put a fence around it. He could have chopped it down or put a wall in front of it, but he didn't. He says, it's right there, nice fruit on it, don't eat it. He had to give us a choice. When Moshe brought the children of Israel from the land, he divided the tribes into onto two hills, and he told them one, reminded them the commandments, and then he said, here, I put before you life and death. Life is as in obedience, death as in disobedience. Then he says, choose life. We make the choice. <laughs> We make the choice. Evil, bad reactions are always in front of us. We make the choice of what we do with it. We are the mighty ones <laughs> with the majesty of choice that God gave us. So let's talk about freedom. By the commandment and the spirit of Hashem, I can be free from the shackles of hatred. By the commandment and the spirit of Hashem, I can be free from the ropes of prejudice. By the commandment and the spirit of Hashem, I can be free from the cage of vengeance. And by the commandment and the spirit of Hashem, I can be free from the chains of anger. Folks, let's be free. Up to us. We have that choice. That's what the Torah teaches us. You know, due to the oppression under that they suffered under Egypt, you know, I mean, it's crazy. Israel had a hard time in their day. I mean, they had lost their freedom. They had lost their children. I mean, they had lost their children. Can you imagine? 
you know, an Egyptian coming, uh, show me a uh, boy, girl, uh, oh boy. Crocodile fruit. You know, I mean, as a mother, think about that. They had lost their dignity as a people. They had lost most of their knowledge concerning the God of Abraham. They didn't have the internet and YouTube and study Torah club books and whatever. But the Torah that Hashem gave them was given to them in the language of their problems in their generation to help them learn how to handle the issues of their day and to help them learn to handle them Hashem's way. The Torah taught the people the spirit of how to handle the issues of hatred, vengeance, prejudice, and anger of their day. I mean, if you read the whole Torah, I tell you, I would say it can be divided into two parts. The ceremonial with all the priests and kosher and all that stuff and Shabbat. And the other part is the interpersonal social issues. How to deal with hatred, vengeance, prejudice, anger, yeah. oh, and oppression, everything. The Torah is full of that. The Torah also spoke, the Torah that the children of Israel received at Mount Horeb, also spoke to the political, economics, and social issue of their day in the language of their day. Told us, told them how to handle money, how to establish leadership upon themselves with the limitations and powers of that leadership, all kinds of stuff. In their day, here's some examples. The people worship dead idols, the product of the work of their hands. Gods who neither talk nor heard. And the verse at the top is a verse uh, from Isaiah. And I'm sorry, I know it's hard to see that talks about it. But Hashem teaches them how to worship the living God, not dead idols. The living God, the one who speaks to them, hears their prayers, hears their cries, and sees their tears. That's what he teaches them, you know. He says, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. That's what he told Moshe. I have seen the tears. I've heard their cries. Wow, what a God. How great is our God. In their day, people worshipped gods who controlled the people through fear. That's what the ideas that they had about about religion. Dead God, mute and deaf God, and who control people through fear. But the Torah came to teach us about a God who loves us, like it says in Isaiah, because I regard you and I as valued and honor, and because I love you. Ezekiel 16 is a beautiful chapter that compares Israel's time in the desert by the mountain, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, as a, ta- as a wedding, the time of a spouse, of spouse. Beautiful text, very poetic. In their days, people were taught about gods who, who valued authoritative strength, power, Hercules, wealth and power but the torah taught us 
about a God who values justice, grace, and purity above strength, wealth, and power. It's not might is right, it's right is might. The Torah was an advocate. It came as a voice to the voiceless. It came as an advocate for the poor and the weak. That's what it did. There is so much in the Torah about punishing he who oppresses the poor and the weak. In their days, people loved God who required human sacrifices, especially young children. Wow. The Torah told us about a God who abhors human sacrifices. I could spend a whole day doing that, you know, making, but I guess you get the idea, right? You know, in their days, uh, employees had no rights. Soldiers could do whatever they wanted with captured people. But the Torah gave laws to ensure that women employee and employees had rights and they would be treated with respect. Actually, a slave in a Jewish household really liked it because by the law of Torah, he was supposed to have one day off a week. If the master was good of the Torah, they had one day off a week pay. There is a Torah law that says that an employee or a slave should not have a bed with inferior comfort than that of his master, should not eat food inferior in quality than that of his master. That if it's a family, they should never be sold separately. I mean, the Torah was very uh, caring for the poor and the weak. In their days, in the days of the children of Israel, there was no agency advocating for the treatment of captured slaves, especially women, but the Torah became the great advocate, which is supposed to be, the great advocate for the respectful treatment of captives, employees, slaves, so that they would be given rest once a week, as well as medical care, and not be sold separately if they had family. Uh, it became the great of uh, advocate that defended the foreigner in the land, as well as the poor, the orphan, and the widow. It also promoted the proper care of animals. Also the care of the land itself through the laws of Shemitah and Jubilee. Even the care of its fruit trees, who were not to be cut in time of war. The soldiers of the Israeli army had to live by certain ethics and even hygiene. You can read it all in Deuteronomy 21. It ensured the proper care of animals, even advocated for a mother bird and for beating us to take her eggs while she is present in the nest. That's the Torah. <laughs> That's the Torah. Uh, it also advocated for the old by commanding children to take care of, of the older mother and father. That's what. That's the basis of the commandment: uh, honor your father and mother. Notice he didn't say, yeah, honor your mother and father. That means really take care of them in the old days. That's what it says. You know, so it's a commandment, takes care of the old. So, so the Torah really 
always, always, always advocate for the poor, the weak, the helpless. Uh, and those things are commandments. And why did Hashem make them commandment? Because He knows the nature of our selfish, wicked, and proud hearts. He knows us how selfish, proud, and wicked we are as human beings. So he made it commandments. The Torah was given to teach the proper treatment of God's creation, be it of mankind made in his image, animal kind, and even of the earth itself. As opposed to most people in, in their day that really didn't care about these things. You know, talking about caring for the earth, it says the same in the end time. The book of Revelation speaks of the time for destroying those who destroy the earth. So, I just was telling you how the Torah addressed the problems of the day. Even Yeshua used the Torah and interpreted it in order to address the social issues of his day, the social, political, and economical issues of his days. He used the Torah because the Torah transcends uh, time and space. So, if the Torah was given today, what would it speak to? Would it speak to the same issues? What, how would it connect? How would those principles that we've, we've seen in the Torah given in Mount Horeb, how would it apply to the principles today, to, to what's going on today? 2022. What are the issues in our world and in our personal lives that Hashem would address today if the Torah was given? Of course, it would use different words, like the Torah spoke of, to the issues of the day in the language of their day. Today, it would address the issues of our day in the language of our day. What if the Torah was given today? Torah, the principles of the Torah, really, they do transcend time <clears throat> and space. But what if in the same way Hashem did with the children of Israel and Mount Horeb, Hashem looked at our world and thought that we needed a little bit of help concerning issues of love, justice, wealth, poverty, freedom, oppression, our notion of knowledge, ignorance, ours and that of others, priority, struggles with others, struggles with ourselves, and even our whole spiritual notion of what it is. What if Hashem felt that the same thing the children of Israel needed to learn, then we need to learn today? What if? To be honest, I think we need to learn the same things. <laughs> we face the same issues, you know. So what would be his commandments? If Hashem was to, were to give his Torah today, would he advocate for... I want to see what says here. Employees? Would he advocate for workers? Would he advocate for 
all the rights of yeah workers for would he would he talk about the issues of the stranger in the land foreigners <laughs> would he talk about the poor the destitute would he address the poverty you know, have you ever gone to Mississippi, Alabama? There's places down south where people do not even have. Uh, I mean, it's, it reminded me when we were in India. I tell you, didn't have a sewer system. Everything was going from the house outside. You know, and there is a there is a lot of you know there is a whole thing. It's called America's dirty secret. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff like that, you know. So, but would Hashem address the issue of poverty? Would he care for the orphans? You know, COVID-19 has left a lot of tragedy. Not just here, but in the world. War has left a lot of tragedy. Not just here, but in the world. You know, would he address the issue of widows by widows? Widows, we talk about, you know, it's like, thank God we live in a society where there is help. But there is a lot of people who don't get it. And in other countries, but also here, but basically the whole idea of the person between the, about the orphan, the poor, I think he's talking about the people who have very little means to support themselves. It's about the poverty. Would he care for the solitary? I've heard one thing one time, the bigger the city, the bigger the problem with loneliness. You know, we live in a nice, cozy little town, you know, but the bigger the city, the bigger the problem with loneliness. Uh, would he address the problem of the old? The old are cared for very often, maybe not, I cannot speak for everybody, but very often he didn't say, he said, honoring your father and mother, support them, and to me, I see that as a personal commandment. Yes, we can get a, a old folks home, a senior citizen home, I don't know what you call them, to take care of them. But really, the top of the line is we take care of our parents. You know, it was like that in my family. You know, when the old grandparent couldn't live by themselves anymore, one of the children took them in. Uh, would the Torah address the vulnerable, whoever that might be, the vulnerable, the care of animals, the care of the land, the care of the trees, ethics within the army? Would, if the Torah was given, were given today, would it talk about all these things? I think it would. I think it would address these things. Because to Hashem, they are important. The right of workers, employees, the treatment of strangers in the land, the concern for the poor, the destitute, the orphan, the window, the orphan, the widow, the solitary, the old, the vulnerable, as well as the care for animals, the care for the land and ethics of the army. Those are things that are all over the Torah. Hashem gave at Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. If the Torah were given today, I think it would talk about the same thing. Would the Torah advocate for the mother bird? And if he advocates for the mother bird, how much more for all mothers there. 
You know, the, the Torah, the, the, the wording of the Torah works that way. It works, if he cares so much for the mother bird, how much more? That's the principle when you read Torah for human mothers. You know, I told you this story probably one day, but one time I, there was a, it was during war in Israel, I think during the Yom Kippur War, there was a young boy who, who was enrolled in the army and the good old Jewish mother, she came to the officer in charge to his office of her son and said, look, my boy, he knew the boy probably was totally embarrassed. I don't know. My boy, he needs this and this and that, you know. Can you make sure he gets it? And the captain answered, well, you know, um, I believe that God hears the prayers of Jewish mothers more than that of army captains. So we'll see what we can do. You know, mothers. You know, the commandment toward mother birds is similar to the fifth commandment to love and honor your mother and father. Most commandments come, do this, don't do that, no explanation. I'm the Lord. That's it. Those two commandments come with a promise. A promise of longevity in the land. Basically. It's said differently, but a promise of longevity in the land. Some people say that uh, this is the thing between the the, the, uh, the small commandment and the big commandment. Uh, I think you should say it. Uh, the, yeah, the weightier and the lighter. So, again, if the Torah were to be given to us today, addressing the problems of today, according to the same principles that we saw, what kind of concerns in our society and our, and our lives would it bring to the fore? Yeshua came when Yeshua was on earth, he came to teach us the proper application of the Torah of Mount Horeb in his own generation, which was not really different from ours. Um, the things he taught, the things Yeshua taught was how to react to oppression from the Romans, it was not the Egyptians, about giving above and beyond, even to enemies, he taught about meekness, humility, things which were not only relevant with the children of Israel in Egypt, but are very relevant to our world today, as they hit our natural animalistic reaction to anger, selfishness, and pride. We have today many of the same problems, and we would do well to address them the way Yeshua taught us. That was the Torah for his day, but also for our days. Why do I say that? The Torah Yeshua taught us, the message Yeshua gave in his days is the same for us today. And I know that because of what it says in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, a section that we often read during our, that we read before we read a section for the bridge during Torah service, where it says, in days gone by, we're talking, the person who wrote that, let's say, first century AD. So, days gone by is before. So, in days gone by, God spoke in many and varied ways to the fathers through the prophets. Okay, well, I understand that. <coughs> but now, now, that's first century AD, in the Acharita Yamin, the end of days, <coughs> This end of days era continues until today, we're in the end time, the end of days, the latter days, that will be later. But we're in the end days, so now in the end days, he speaks to us through his son, to whom he has given ownership of everything. He's the big boss, and through whom he <coughs> created the universe. The sun is the radiance of the Shekhinah, the presence, the bright presence of God, the very expression of God's essence. What a description of Yeshua. Upholding all that exists by his powerful 
word. He upholds us by his word. And after he had through himself made purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of Abdullah Bambumi. That means he's the right hand man. The executive. God speaks, he does. You know, so, so it's really important. The things, how Yeshua taught people how to react to Roman oppression, or to the oppression of their leaders, to, to poverty, to sickness, to everything. That's our word for today. That's our message. That's our message for us today. And we can read a lot of it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So Yeshua gave us Torah application for our lives for today. So now I'll go back to that class, my friend was talking about what is Yeshua meant exactly what he said. Whoa, our world would be really different. Or, or what if Yeshua's disciple Paul were to write to us today? What would he say? Maybe he would say, oh boy, I don't even know where to start with you guys. Abba Father, we have so many things that uh, we go through. Our world seems to be going through uh, birthing pains. And maybe it is. Uh, and uh, you sent us Yeshua to tell us how to use the teachings of the Torah in order to, uh, to teach us how to handle uh, what we're being dished out in our life by the world, what you allow us to be dished out in our life. Um, we pray that you help us as we study the Torah, as we study the word of Yeshua and the apostles and the prophet, that you help us find these principles that help us, help us to process uh, our daily lives in your spirit, by your spirit, and again, letting you transform us into the image of your son. This Bisham Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Okay. So we've worshipped through DTG. We've worshipped through prayers. We've worshipped through reflection and study. Now we will worship through music. And then we'll worship through food. <laughs> <laughs>